appendicitis. We've all heard of it. Maybe some of us have even had it or known someone who's had it, which is not unheard of because appendicitis is actually one of the most common causes of emergency abdominal surgery worldwide. So we're gonna talk about what it is, what causes it, some of the symptoms that are associated with appendicitis, how we even treat it, and of course, all the relevant anatomical awesomeness. So let's get to it. So let's start with what the appendix actually is. The appendix actually has a longer name called the vermiform appendix. Vermiform just means worm-like, appendix just refers to an appendage. And the appendix is a worm-like appendage off of this structure called the cecum. Now the cecum is part of the large intestine and we went over that in our digestive system video. So if you want a little review about that, go ahead and check that other video out. But I'm going to show you that on the current cadaver right here. So go ahead and take a look. You can see we've removed all the skin from the anterior body wall or the front of the abdomen here. This is about where the belly button would be. Coming down here is the pubic bone. And then so this is the left side of the abdomen, the right side of the abdomen. The appendix is on the right lower quadrant or the right lower portion of the abdominal cavity. Now, if I reflect this away, you can see there's the abdominal muscles reflected away and we come immediately to this structure called the greater omentum. This is a really cool structure. It's just this apron that drapes over the intestines and I shouldn't say it's just this. We're gonna learn some cool functions with this and even how it can apply to appendicitis later in this video. But let me reflect it away and you can actually see all of the small intestines that I'm lifting up here. And they're attached to this yellowy tissue called the mesentery that's actually holding them to the back of the body wall here. But the appendix is over here on this side. So what I need to do is actually lift up the cecum. This is that structure that I was saying the appendix comes off of. And you can see this little worm-like structure that I'm pulling out right here. And that's the vermiform appendix. It's about two to three inches long and this is a structure that we're going to talk about getting inflamed or infected here. So a lot of the times people will say, what is the function of the appendix? A lot of people will refer to this as a vestigial structure or a vestigial organ, like a vestige of time, or essentially it's a structure that has lost some of its functionality through evolution. Now, it's not necessary, but it does perform some potential functions. And when we say it's not necessary, people get the appendix removed all the time and they do just fine. But it doesn't mean it doesn't do anything at all. Now we do know that the appendix has a lot of lymphatic nodules in it. And those are just conglomerations of white blood cells. And what that does is it helps monitor bacteria and potential pathogens that are potentially coming into the large bowel. Now there's also some theories that the appendix actually has some a storehouse or a safe house for what we call good bacteria or normal flora. So in situations where people have major diarrhea, dysentery, some people mention cholera, or even major, major bouts of diarrhea that clears out the, the stool and even some of the good bacteria, it's theorized that some of that good bacteria can be replenished in that, from that little teeny tiny appendix that's not quite as affected from those major bouts of diarrhea. So when the appendix becomes inflamed, we refer to it as appendicitis. But what initiates this process? Well, we have to understand that the appendix, even though it's a small little structure, it's actually still a tube, meaning it's hollow inside. What happens is the inside of the appendix or the lumen, which if you compared that to a hose, like a garden hose, the inside of the hose is referred to as, let's say, like a lumen. Now that lumen of the appendix would be obstructed and it can get obstructed by a number of different things. It can get obstructed from fecal lists, which is essentially clogged with poop. And we also can get it obstructed with undigested or foreign material. Sometimes it gets inflamed from the lymphatics surrounding it and an, an infective process where the lumen gets constricted because the wall literally gets inflamed. And sometimes it can even be caused by tumors. So once the obstruction of the appendix starts, things are going to continue to progress. Because I want you to imagine if there's a blockage inside of a hollow tube, that's going to increase the pressure inside the tube and in this case, the appendix. It's also gonna put pressure on the walls of the tube. Think of the walls of a hose in this case. And inside the walls of the appendix, there are little blood vessels and little lymphatic vessels that are being compressed. If you compress those vessels, one, you don't get a good blood supply coming in, and you also don't drain old blood out very well. This will cause the appendix to get engorged, inflamed, and even enlarged. And that's when you'll start to get pain signals. 
So those initial pain signals coming from the appendix, they're referred to as visceral pain. Now, visceral just means pertaining to an internal organ. Now, our body isn't great at localizing visceral pain. What I mean by that is oftentimes visceral pain will kind of be like a referred pain. We'll feel the pain in an area where the problem actually isn't occurring. For example, we know that the appendix is in that right lower quadrant here. But a lot of the time, people will initially feel pain, or at least the initial pain from appendicitis, around the belly button, kind of the central hard to localize pain that's in the center or periumbilical is what they're referred to it as. Now, as the pain gets worse or the inflammation of the appendix gets worse, we'll start to get other tissues involved that are much better at localizing that pain signal. So to understand how the pain starts to become more localized with appendicitis, we have to jump back and talk about how we mentioned appendicitis can progress and progress and get worse. Now, we started with obstructing the tube. And then due to that obstruction, we increased pressure on that tube and the appendix started to get inflamed and engorged. The next thing that tends to happen is bacteria starts to grow out of control and invade the actual surrounding wall of the appendix. As that happens, the wall of the appendix gets more inflamed and even the surrounding tissues get inflamed. Now, let me actually show you the tissue that I'm talking about here. So if I, again, reflect the abdominal body wall out of the way, and you take a look at this glossy tissue right here, this is referred to as the parietal peritoneum. Now the parietal peritoneum or the peritoneum is a serous sac that surrounds the actual abdominal cavity and the intestines, and it lines the inside of the wall here. Now we'll do some more specific videos on this stuff, but for right now, I wanna mention that this stuff is actually innervated by different types of nerves, and they're called somatic nerves, or we'd have somatic sensation in this case. Now, somatic sensation is much more pinpoint accurate. That's the type of pain that you feel in, say, like muscles or on the skin when you get cut. And these don't tend to refer as much as, say, visceral pain. Now, take a look here. If I point here and I lay it down here, I want you to imagine the appendix here getting inflamed and this tissue over the top of it also getting inflamed. And if that tissue over the top of the appendix also gets inflamed, that can start to localize the pain to that right lower quadrant. But again, it takes a little while for that to actually progress. Now, there are some exceptions to this. There are some people who won't feel that right lower quadrant pain, and that's due to often the appendix being in a slightly different orientation than say the average orientation of the appendix. So what are the classic symptoms of appendicitis? Well, abdominal pain, which we've already covered, which often will go to the right lower quadrant, you also will see anorexia, which people just don't feel like eating when they have appendicitis. Also nausea, vomiting. That's kind of that classic presentation of appendicitis. People will often also have a low grade fever of around like 101. Now, it's always nice when you're a clinician and people fit into that classic box of this symptom, this symptom, and that symptom, but not everybody will present just perfectly like that. Some people will often have other symptoms like indigestion, flatulence, don't be ashamed, it's appendicitis. You can't control that, right? Also, there's bowel irregularities in some patients, even diarrhea, and just that general feeling of like aches and just not feeling well like you're ill. So finally, how do we treat appendicitis? Well, those of you who have had experience with appendicitis are probably gonna say, yank that thing out of there. And that is correct. That is still the current standard of treatment in the United States is what we call an appendectomy, removal of the appendix. But did you know that you can actually treat appendicitis with antibiotics? Whenever I tell people that, I always get this response of, what conspiracy, what's going on? Why are we doing all these surgeries? And the answer to that question is that even though the rates of curing appendicitis are pretty favorable with just antibiotic use, in some studies, up to 90% of people responded favorably to antibiotics, there's still that 10%. And we don't know when you have a patient in front of you, if they are going to respond well to the antibiotics. And so are we putting people at risk for a rupture of the appendix? Another risk is that 30% of people treated with antibiotics in those studies tend to come back within five years with another episode of appendicitis and end up having to get the appendix removed anyway. And because of that, and with the success of laparoscopic surgeries, we've chosen to essentially say, okay, we're gonna still help this overall decrease the risk of complications 
and future complications with appendicitis just by simply removing it. So the last thing we need to talk about regarding appendicitis is one of the complications that people will often ask about. And that is, what if the appendix ruptures or perforates? So let's take a look at the cadaver to kind of help us with that story. Now, if you take a look at, again, the abdominal cavity, and I'll pull up the appendix here, this little guy, if it potentially ruptures, that could spread fecal matter, bacteria, pus, and just that infective material. Now, there's a couple of different scenarios that can happen in this situation. One is called free perforation. What that means is that infective material or the material coming out of the appendix can freely move throughout the whole abdominal cavity, and that is more of a serious complication, and they'll actually wanna operate pretty quickly with that. Also, if the patient is showing signs of sepsis or unstable, they'll also immediately operate. Now, not all patients are actually unstable when they present with a perforated appendix. There's this really cool thing called the greater omentum that can actually drape over and actually contain the ruptured material or the ruptured appendix. And so it doesn't spread throughout the whole abdominal cavity. Also other situations, an abscess will form around that appendix. And that abscess, yes, it's a collection of pus, but it contains it in that localized region again. Now on imaging, if the abscess is less than say three centimeters, they'll go ahead and take them to surgery and do an appendectomy. If the abscess is greater than three centimeters, they'll actually do what's called a percutaneous drainage of the abscess, which is just draining the abscess through the skin. And they'll also put them on antibiotics. If they get clinical improvement, they'll actually wait to do the appendectomy till they're done with an antibiotic course and as long as they keep improving clinically. As always, we hope that gave you a better understanding of appendicitis and the anatomy that's involved with appendicitis. And as always, please give us comments and feedback of anything else that you wanna see. We love reading through those and love your guys' suggestions.